Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and I am so glad you've decided to join us. Well, I know I'm excited about spring, and I love talking to gardeners this time of year because we're always so optimistic. Maybe you're thinking about what are you gonna plant this year, and you're really trying to figure out what you're gonna order through the catalogs. Well, we're here to help you out. So why don't you go ahead and give us a call, uh, and we'll see what we can do. But at first, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists who I know are always very optimistic about gardening. How about you, Chuck? Sure. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> I am Chuck Voigt and I was a vegetable and herb specialist with the crop sciences department here on campus. I'm retired now, which gives me more time to uh, play um, <laughs> in the garden. Uh, my question tonight is about spring herb planting, which fits right in with what you were saying. Uh, Kate asks, uh, sh she'd like to plant some herbs in, in, in her vegetable garden, and she wants to know if rosemary, cilantro, basil, and thyme would work in zone five, uh, which a lot of mid-America is, uh, and when's the best time to plant them? Well, I think in terms of, if you, if you think a little timing, all of those things can be grown here. Um, thyme is the most cold hardy, so if you can find started thyme plants, you could put those out probably as, as early as early April around here and, and probably get by with that. Um, rosemary, fairly cold hardy, but not as cold hardy, especially when it's just freshly planted. Uh, so I would probably wait till maybe late April in zone five to do that. Um, cilantro, cilantro needs to get started. It's plant the seeds pretty early in, in spring, like early April. And then maybe you, you can get some leaf harvest from it. Uh, the, uh, it's going to go to seed as the days get longer. So it's a very short window in spring. Uh, if, you, if you save some of the seeds that develop into coriander, well, you can use them as coriander, but you can also plant them in August, and then they'll come up in the fall. And uh, in the short days of fall, they'll, they'll stay leafy a long time. So, so you have kind of a short spring season and a longer fall season for cilantro and basil is a heat lover don't put basil plants out really until memorial day throughout most of zone five and then probably about labor day on the other end is when they start to decline so you have about a three month window when basil does really well here and um, i almost guarantee that that in, in early march you'll see basil seedlings in the garden centers but uh if you plant those, you're probably going to have to buy them and plant them again. So just wait till closer to the end of May and, and enjoy it while it's having its brief reign of glory and, mm -hmm. and, and go with that way. But all those things are possible, just you have to know a little bit about what you're doing. So it is one of those things where you really need to do maybe a little bit, a little bit of homework. Uh, maybe call your local <coughs> U of I Extension office or the master talk to the master gardeners for your area when to plant because some of them are some of them are annual, some of them are perennial, some of them you start from seeds, you know, some of them, you know, it's just it's it's hard. Even though they're all herbs, we kind of treat them differently. Right. 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 So that's probably a big. And, and zone five encompasses a lot of territory, <laughs> that's so right. some of it's almost zone six and some of it's almost zone four. So that's the beauty of gardening. We're always it, learning. It, it all right? depends. It all <laughs> depends. It all depends. Okay. Very good. And Marianne. Good evening, I'm Marianne Metz, and I am a horticulturalist, landscape designer, and definitely a gardener, living in anticipation of gardening this year. I cannot wait. Um, I have a question from uh, Ron in St. Charles. Uh, the city has installed a crab apple tree on the curb in front of the street in front of his house and about four years ago it seems to have some type of scale or fungus and the photo that he sent um, really does indicate some kind of a, a scaly looking creature on, on the branches of his tree, um, which are I, I think are kind of pretty, but um, not everybody appreciates that kind of nature. But um, actually I want him to know that not to worry. This is actually a lichen, uh, which is not a, a, a genus of itself, but it's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between um, fungus and, and algae, and they they can't live apart. They have to have each other to live. Um, they're not taking anything from the tree, so they're not harming the tree. And think of it as beauty spots, you know, it's kind of a nice thing. And and actually, as a healthy environment, um, with, with the canopy open and enough sun coming into the um, branches, the lichen's gonna grow. So that's a good thing. And it's it's on the street. So there's going to be pollution, but there's 
apparently not a lot of pollution because lichen will not grow where there's pollution. Mm -hmm. So all, all good news. And it, we often see it on crab apples, mm -hmm. so that's Absolutely. one thing. And I will say, so, you know, sometimes you'll see the lichens on dead branches, and yes. people automatically assume the Think lichens somehow happens. killed the dead branch. Exactly. But it really, that wasn't the reason why the branch died. No, so I think exactly sometimes right. it's very confusing when people see dead branches. The, the branch died. Right. Yeah, it was absolutely. probably there before the branch died. So anyway, so yep. very good. So good question. Thank you very much, Marianne. And John? Um, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener, and I'm from Bismarck, Illinois. I like hostas because I've got mostly shade in my yard now and I have a lot of perennials, trees, shrubs. Sandy got me into a lot of shrubs <laughs> and uh, vegetables and tomatoes. But tonight I've got actually one of the questions on hostas. Uh, we have planted um, a lot of hostas on the east side of the white brick house. In the summer it gets extremely hot and the hostas get very brown and scorched looking. Is it too hot for them and should be transplanted somewhere else? Um, probably. <clears throat> uh, the white house was the first thing. Uh, white reflects, so um, the heat and, and the light, uh, so that's going to make it worse than uh, dark toned wood. Or uh, East side is better than the west side or on the south side because at least you're, the, it's probably only getting the morning, maybe a little bit of the afternoon sun. Uh, but hostas like moisture and that would be, that's a, being there brown and scorched kind of gives me an indication that, it, you know, if it was just the, the light, they, they would be faded and um, wilty and things like that. But being scorched and brown, that t indicates to me that they're probably not getting enough moisture because they do require it. But if you do want, I would probably move them because if you have a shady area, they'll probably do much, much better on a, a shady area and uh, there are varieties that do like sun um, that they've come out with and you might want to look into them and put those there and transplant these into a shady area. Okay. okay, very good. And it is one of those kind of right plant, right place. Yep. And the good news about springtime, it's a great time to move to move plants. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. if they weren't doing well, then move them somewhere else where you think they're going to do very, mm -hmm. do better. Oh, thank you very much, John. And I just want to remind everybody, if, if you haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast, there really are a lot of fun. Diane Nolan did one, Mike Brunk did one, and guess what? I'm going to be doing the next one. So if you have any questions for me for the <coughs> podcast, remember you can leave questions on our Facebook page, you can email us, you can also leave a voicemail for our podcast, and that's at 217-300-8224, and that's for uh, questions you might have for the podcast. And so come up with something that you think you'd like me to talk about, because I, I would love to see, you know, what kinds of things you might have interest in. I know, otherwise, Victoria and I are just going to talk about gardening stuff that we want to talk about, so give us your questions. So. But you can go ahead and call us, of course, for tonight's show, and that number is 217 333 Three four nine five. So you're certainly welcome to give us some calls for tonight. And we do have a caller online to Steve from Bloomington. Uh, looks like you have some question about herbs, Steve. I do, Sandy. Uh, I've seen the podcast that you were just talking about, and they were awesome. Oh, great! Thanks. Right. Um, but what I would like to ask you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but if you could be a herb, <laughs> what would it be? And why? And why? Yeah. Oh, to be. Oh, good question. That is good. Uh, personally, I would probably be rosemary, because I love I love that kind of evergreen you know mm -hmm. smell that it has. I love it's cooking with it. In so the it's night. a l wonderful smell. Yeah, very invigorating smell. It's a, sometimes a little bit of challenge to sort of keep it growing mm -hmm. through the winter time. But I have it indoors as an indoor plant, and it's the one plant the 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 cats don't mess with because huh. I think it's so aromatic they don't mess with it. So how about you guys? Any other oh. your like favorite herb? Uh, mine is summer savory. What would you be? Summer savory? Oh, I, it's one that I grew up. My we grow it. We we put it in a lot of our sausages that we, I grew up in the German. Uh, family and we use it in a lot of our sausages and and uh, the French use it a lot in their bean dishes and so I've gotten to incorporate those into bean dishes but there's summer savory which is an annual and then there's winter savory which is a perennial the winter savory isn't quite as strong as the uh, summer savory but then you don't have to plant it every year either and mm. it's always right. available and so that's one of my favorites. Okay, so what would you be? Oh, you were basil, definitely. Oh, basil. basil. That's a good choice. I plant basil all over my yard. I'm not. I don't cook. That's. Not, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it's but just for pretty basil. You don't oh, cook. You look. No, I look. <laughs> yeah. No, I love walking by it and brushing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I'll so put it along pathways and in the pots. 
containers, mixed containers on my patio, so everyone can smell it. I just love the fragrance and there's of it. Beautiful ones now. Oh, there's some gorgeous Real small leaves, purple leaves, little dwarfs that you could line basils. a bed with. There's yeah. just a lot in the oh, market. Oh yeah, that's now. a nice, nice variety. Yeah. Nice variety. Yeah. And you, Chuck? Well, I wrote a thesis on propagating French tarragon, so I'm oh, going to go with French tarragon. Got to do it. <laughs> and it gives me an opportunity to w warn people again that you're not going to find French tarragon seeds. It's okay. it's incapable of making seeds. And mm. sometimes they label them brush and tarragon. Sometimes they they label them French tarragon, but it's it, it's never correct. You need to buy a started plant and one that's propagated vegetatively. A so. French tarragon. Oh, I love that is a good one too. I like it. It's a, it's a sterile chromosomal derivative if you're into <laughs> science. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> we won't ask it, you to it, delve the, into the that The chromosomes too much can't more. match up to make seeds. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> Learn something new. And, okay, very good. Thank you very much, Steve. That was kind of fun. And online for we have Gene, and it looks like you, maybe you're having some problems with uh, tomatoes, Gene. Uh, actually, uh, can you hear me there? Uh huh. Okay, actually, I have a suggestion for people who do have uh, problems with diseases on their oh, tomatoes. Oh, okay. Because I tried this myself. I put a oat t-shirt around the base of the tomato plant after I put my tomato cages on in order to keep the weeds down. And what it did, actually, in the last two years, I've had no problem at all with the weeds slicing up on my tomato drink. Oh. So and just I think it must dry out or something and help keep it from getting, getting too moist or something. But it really works very well. And I just so, wanted to share that with all the other viewers. Okay, like a cotton t-shirt, like around your yep. plants? Nice. Good, Good recycling. Very yeah, nice. it, it would it would keep the spores from splashing, splashing up on the lower yeah. leaves because yeah. that's typically what happens. They get exactly. on the lower leaves and then they climb the plant like a ladder. Yep. Oh, very good. Well, good <coughs> idea, Gene. And I love recycling in the garden. And you could have just your whatever T-shirts you, you just can't stand <laughs> to throw away or whatever, and you want to see them one last time. Put them in the garden. I like that, Gene. Thank you very much. That's great. And on line five, we have John. And sounds like you have a, a question about maybe um, tapping maple trees. So, John from Decatur. Yeah, I had a question. We got a maple tree in the front yard, and is there a certain type of maple tree that you can tap for syrup or any kind? Okay, tapping you can maple trees. Tap any of them. I just got done tapping mine. I have a sugar maple, and then I have a softwood maple. I even have a silver maple, and I got some sap out of that. Uh, the problem is the sugar maples will give you a lot more sugar in those, you know, per sure. ounce. So. Uh, for sugar maples, you need 40 gallons of sap to make a gallon of, of syrup. Soft maples, the other types of maples, 50 gallons of wow. sap to make a gallon of syrup. That's so, a lot. so it takes, <laughs> but it's really nice. You, you, you know, boil it down in the house, and all of a sudden your house, you know, during the winter, your house is, is dry, and, and uh, you start cooking your maple syrup sure. down, and it makes you feel better. Sure. You don't touch somebody and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. I, I would think you wouldn't want to do Norway maple because it has milky sap, but oh yeah, right. No. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So either so probably typically around here it would probably be like silvers or sugars. Sugars could you get soft more sugar hardwood content. Any sugar would be number one. Yeah, yeah, number one. probably silver would be yeah. the other one. Silver, be right maybe up there. red. I maybe even, maybe I, even box elder, but yes, you can do box <coughs> elder. I even uh, walnut, black walnut. There's, oh, uh, interesting! I tried yeah. that this year. I haven't got it boiled down right. yet. Yeah. But I've heard that uh, it's different. Black so. walnut it, syrup? I've never it, heard of that one. I don't know which birch, but there's birch syrup that they mm -hmm. make as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow! Interesting. It's a whole new category of things to do in the winter time. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good question. Thank you very much. And they're just about one thing. They're just about done because if you look at the trees, if they're if they if you've got little red tips on them. You're probably not going to get too much sap. Right, running. so it has to be, yeah, kind of during that time period. Uh, good question. I'm glad you asked that. And on line uh, three, we have uh, Steve and from Decatur, and you have a question about starting sassafras trees. Mm -hmm. What can we do for you, Steve? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm wanting to uh, plant a sassafras tree in my backyard as kind of a specimen tree, but I don't know how to go about it. And I've read that they have a long tap root, so I okay. I don't know if I could do. Uh, root propagation or how, how, I was wanting to ask you how I would do that. Okay, well, super. Well, yeah, when you get a, a sassafras tree, typically they'll root in and then they'll, they'll do horizontal thick mm -hmm. roots and then every so often they'll, oh, they'll throw up another shoot so that you end up with a whole, a whole group of, of plants that are genetically the same from that one. 
you can kind of dig one of those up and try to do it. I've had some success with that. Best to do it early on before, they're, before the leaves come on, because once they have leaves, there's, there's just too much stress on them. Um, and then you're probably not going to have a lot of success, but you might have enough so that you have a tree. Um, uh, if you want to punt, they have container plants at nurseries now that you can buy a sassafras tree that way. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the surest way to get yes. one. Um, but, and I think theoretically you could dig up a piece of root and, and, root it and get that to sprout. Uh, it would be better if you treated it with some sprout uh, inducer, but and get uh, a long bag. You know those bag, those yeah. bag. Uh, uh, so how big a seedling are you think, or how big a shoot? I should say, not a seedling. Would would you think to dig up? Is it better to do some of the short, smaller ones? I'm thinking. I would say if you're if you're trying to dig them up from a wild stand right. of them in a fence row or whatever, uh, an inch or under. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. smaller definitely. ones are probably better. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Three quarters yes. to three eighths to a half an inch would probably be yeah. even so better. So this would be a good time to do it. Well. Right. If, you, get, good, if you know which one they are, yeah, yeah, so, at this time, yeah, great, great Don't do native poison tree. ivy that's growing next. Yeah, door. great native tree. And you can always smell the. You can always, yeah, you know, smell the root. Smell, smell it. You can smell that wonderful sassafras smell. Oh. So great, great idea. Okay, and on line two we have uh, Paulette from Urbana, and you have a question about cherry trees. I guess it's not doing well. They're not fruiting well for you, Paulette. Yes. Um, thank you for taking this call. Sure. I have two trees. One's about eight years old, and the other five. And um, my big crop was maybe four cherries on one of the trees. And I'm hoping that there's something that I'm doing wrong that you could tell me, and then um, maybe this year I'll be luckier. Okay. Are they flowering? Um, they appear First to thing. be quite healthy. So are they flowering? Do they seem like they're flowering well? Oh, for you? yes. Okay. I have so they're a flowering, lot of flowers. But, but not getting right. any fruit. And are they tart cherries or are they sweet cherries? Uh, uh, Tart. Like a uh, one's a red, one red sour, and the other's a yellow. But it's not a queen anne. It's not that type. It's like a yellow cherry. That's a sour cherry. Wow. So okay. I don't think I've ever seen a yellow, a yellow tart cherry. There's a lot of new things in the market. <laughs> so uh, you'd wonder if it's flowering. Then, so we'd wonder about things like proper pollination. Pollen pollination, pollination would, be would probably be the. Happen. And most of those are, I think, self-pollinating. Yeah, yeah. So that shouldn't be. So the tart cherries are self. Um, you'd still want some bee activity. You want, uh, yeah, and you and and, and being she got four, it might be that. There is no other, the other cherry tree may not be crossed because you usually get better. Oh, definitely, better. Better crops from. Crops, if you do get some cross mm -hmm. pollination, mm -hmm. you don't yeah, need definitely. it, but you get a lot more, but four is, is very. Yeah, I, would, I would think the pollinator would be would maybe the biggest issue, yeah. whether there's something pollinated. And maybe there's some kind of chemical drift from, from something close around that's keeping pollinators away. You're not fertilizing, are you? That's yeah, one thing I sure. wouldn't do too. Is, yeah, make sure you don't over fertilize. over fertilize with, especially with nitrogen. Uh, then you will have beautiful trees, and you're, they won't set fruit because they just don't think they need it. Okay, okay. And so the big thing is with the tart cherries, we probably have better success usually mm -hmm. with tart cherries mm -hmm. than we have with the sweet cherries, yes. just because of the problems with, with hardiness mm -hmm. of the flowers themselves and stuff. So that would be one thing to keep. And in that's mind. another thing. The last couple of years we've had nice spring flowers and all of a sudden a hard frost oh, and yes. that just wiped uh, yeah. some of the crops out. So, so it could be, you, you may not be doing anything wrong. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait just for be better patient. weather. <laughs> wait for better. Okay, now on line six we have Peggy from Champaign and you have a, a, a question about, sounds like a philodendron. It's been yes, around for a while. Yes, simple house plant that I've had for 38 years and oh, wow. uh, used to take better care of it than I have lately. I'm living in a small apartment in a senior residence and uh, it hasn't had, it's been, it's gotten cold and it's, uh, hasn't had the right amount of light, so it has it has three or four very long stems with no leaves on them now, and then at the end there are lots and lots of leaves. Mm -hmm. And I'm I think it probably needs to be repotted with new dirt, but I don't know what to do with the with the long stems. I don't want to cut them because the roots are at, sure. at the, you know at one end. <laughs> Is this a vine? I don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah it sounds like the vining philodendron. I'd say go I'd, for it. I'd say Perfect. cut the ends off Absolutely and right. and get them planted and don't cut the others off until you're sure that the new plant is going because you always could maybe take another cutting. Even though there's no leaves, sometimes you can force them to. 
Yeah, and the beauty of the philodendron is that usually you can see like the little baby roots. So yeah. It's like it's oh, trying yeah. to root, and so yeah, it's yeah. really easy to tell where yeah. the roots They're are going to come out. So you might be really surprised on how very easy they are to propagate. Yes, so. and, and, and repotting won't, won't hurt it by any means, and getting, freshening up the soil, mm -hmm. maybe a, a tad bit of fertilizer now uh, when things are starting to actively grow again. With a yeah, more so soil. I'd cut off the ends, start them. Mm -hmm. Go from there. Yeah. So great. Hopefully that helps you out. And on line uh, three, we have Jan from Jacksonville. And how about some sweet potatoes? It sounds like a wonderful thing, Jan. Yes, Hi. Hi. My, my question is raising sweet potatoes as food uh, product. I know they like to have lots of uh, room to spread out. But can you uh, terrace or, or raise those on a trellis or some way to reduce the amount of Space they take up. Oh, good question. So sweet potatoes, space. I think yes. Um, I've never tried that, but I think if if you can get them trained, trained on it, yeah. they're they're not. Although they're vining, they're not naturally climbing. Right. So you would have to uh, use wire or something that has small enough holes so that it holds them up, like chicken wire or mm -hmm. something. And exactly. Them, actually tie them. You know. Yeah. And and if, I think the more of them that you get on the wires the more it's going to hold the, the others in there right. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to do them like vertically so that they shade each, shade, shade, uh, each other out, I don't think. Right. M maybe like a 45 degree angle or something, if, if you could do it that way. Um, and then if you, if, if you, if you find that you can, you can do variety selection, there are some that are much more compact. Unfortunately, uh, like... Um, the, the bush Puerto Rico is one of the worst ones I've ever tried to grow. Uh, <laughs> Beauregard, which is a very long vining one, is, is almost foolproof here. And, That's and, one I grow. Yeah, and, 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 do, and does well. Um, so I, I think the answer to your question is yes, yes, you can do that. It may take quite a bit of work to get it started that way. Um, but... Uh, and I and I just grow mine in raised beds, and they just flow over the raised exactly. bed yeah, and kind yeah. of into the exactly. into the rows and everything else, or into the paths and everything else. But that's fine. It's yeah. still so it's you know, and it's a four by eight raised bed, and it seem, they yeah. seem to do very well there. But how, how pretty would that be, crawling up a, a kind of an yeah. angled trellis? I think that would yeah. be a really good, good look. Well, yeah, space conserving. Some are really attractive. Yeah, I kind love of a sweet potatoes. Kind of purplish undercolor. I like the heat, though. Yeah. Sweet potatoes nice. love the heat. Okay, very good. And on line uh, two, we have Steve from Effingham, and you have a question, sounds like, about white pine trees. Hmm. What can we do yeah, for you, Steve? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have uh, probably eight or nine of them, range from uh, two to four foot, and a couple of them about maybe 15 or 12 to 15 foot tall, and they seem to all died this year. Uh-oh. White pine's dying. And I got a one that's probably 50 foot tall, and I wonder if it's in danger of dying. There's a lot of reasons they could die. <coughs> um, the, the, the season, the, just the, the, the bad summers, a hot, dry, We've had a wet, couple, of, a couple hot, of seasons dry, that have been pow, hot, pow, pow, yeah, exactly. It's been drought, there, there are fungal issues that, that it could be, uh, but I, I'm going to go with drought. It's yeah. one of the biggest causes for white pines to succumb so quickly. And your biggest one is probably okay, being it's been a chance to get its roots down. Down further, Bigger, yeah. so. But if so, there's any life, I would right. I would probably just make sure if you have, a, if there's any life at all left, that you really water them during dry periods. Yeah. One, of, one of the essential things is watering really well before you go into the winter. But mm -hmm. evergreens that have moisture in them as we uh, get colder will survive much better, especially in a cold winter like we've just had. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. some tough environmental issues. And on line four, we have Sean from Springfield. Do you have a quick question for us about, sounds like planting different fertilizers maybe for vegetables? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, especially this time of year, if it's too early to start, you know, applying that fertilizer or utilizing any uh, fertilizers. And then also, um, th this may sound a little weird, but is it okay to use my dog poo as fertilizer? Second question first, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use dog yeah. poo. Or any, or any pets, yeah. any poo, carnivores. Dog poo, cat, cat poo particularly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fertilizer, I'd say it's still a little early yes. because we're going to get spring rains and things are going to run off, especially if the soil freezes again. Um, yeah, you're just putting money down for right. nothing. Right. And, and, you're, and you're not able to incorporate it because it's too muddy. So I would wait until, until the soil dries out and you can start working with it. 
uh, apply it, work it in so that it's protected. Um, because the other thing that happens if it gets overly wet is the, the nitrogen denitrifies mm -hmm. and just okay. goes back into yeah. the okay. air. Very good. The, the okay. one thing thank I you would all use very the, much. And it, yeah, sorry, we're, we're running out of time. <laughs> I, thank you all very much. I know lots of good questions. And remember, you can always email us at yourgarden at gmail.com. Uh, go to our Facebook page. And certainly, if you have any questions uh, for me for the podcast, uh, make sure that you send those in as well. And we'll have a great week gardening. And this has always been an exciting time, I think, to think about spring and gardening. And, and I know you have lots of questions. So make sure you send those in. And we'll make sure that we either handle them on the show or through our podcast. So have a great week gardening. I know I'm looking forward to it.